All right, um, we're going to we're going to get ahead and get started here. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us today for today's webinar. My name is uh, Marwa Gumrawi, your moderator, and this webinar is hosted by the Washington Center for Yemeni Studies. In today's webinar discussion, the domino effect of the instability in Yemen in correspondence with the release of our new study, FSO Safir, a floating ticking bomb, the event will shine a light on the political instability in Yemen and the significance of its consequences on the region and the international scene using the Safir thinker as a case study. I would like to welcome our speakers today. Uh, Ms. Fatima Abul Asrar, a non-resident scholar at the Middle East Institute, and at Caesar, a contributing staff writer to the New Yorker. Unfortunately, Dr. Abdul Qadir Al Kharraz will not be joining us today to, due to an emergency. However, we will be sending his report, "Expected Environmental Hazards of the Ship Safar," along with the study um, from WCYS and the event report. Just a few reminders before we get started. If everyone could please mute themselves. Just real quick. All right. And in today's session, we it will be entirely in English. However, we will email all participants a report summarizing this webinar in Arabic and in English. If you have any questions during the session, uh, please type them into the chat box or in the comment section on Facebook, and we will have them answered during our Q&A session at the end. للحضور المتحدث باللغة العربية ندوة اليوم ستناقش سفينة صافر وستكون باللغة الإنجليزية وسنصدر تقرير باللغتين يلخص الندوة. لمن لديه أسئلة للمتحدثين الرجاء إرسالها عبر الشات أو كتعليق على الفيسبوك. And without further ado, I will present our first speaker today, uh, Fatima Abul Asrar. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, she's a non-resident scholar at the Middle East Institute. Before joining the Institute, Al Asrar was a senior analyst at the Arabia Foundation in Washington, DC, uh, MENA director for Cure Violence, research associate at the Arab Gulf States Institute in Washington, a Mason fellow at the Kennedy School of Government and an international policy fellow at the Open Society Foundation. From 2006 to 2012, she worked as an advisor for the Embassy of Yemen in Washington, DC. Earlier in her career, Fatima served as a program officer for the Department of International Development in Yemen. Fatima, thank you for joining us today. Uh, thank you so much, Marwa. Um, can you hear me fine? Yes, yes. Perfect. So um, we're starting off with me, although by no means am I an expert in either environment or in the in the sulfur oil tanker problem. Um, but we're starting with me because I have to rush uh, after 10 minutes uh, to catch a flight. So um, to start off, I and I'm, I'm taking, you know, just from a somebody who is not tuned in Yemen or does not uh, know Yemen very well. I'm just going to give a brief background. So what is the software oil tanker? Um, and uh, it basically, you know, I'm, I'm going to assume that anybody who has joined in has some type of an idea, but it is um, basically a floating storage um, uh, ship that is or unit that is located off the coast of Yemen and was a carrier for oil. And um, it has been carrying crude oil for a very long time and has been operational until the conflict in 2015 where it was neglected. Um, so it, it basically exports from the, uh, or it holds the, the exports from the Ma'rib oil fields. Um, and we know currently there is a conflict in Ma'rib. Um, and it's owned by Yemen's national oil company. Um, so the, the software exploration and production operation company. Um, so because of the conflict in Yemen, um, the production and the export operations related to software has been uh, suspended. But the problem here is that it still, it still holds about um, uh, 1 million Ba barrels of crude oil in the ship. And um, the 
The problem that lies here is that the ship is basically rusting. Um, it, it has not been maintained since 2015. Um, and it has been um, cut, out, cut off, you know, all sort of assessments. Nobody is able to um, uh, access or monitor the ship. And um, the, the Houthis don't want to also give access to this ship for maintenance. Um, and what this basically means is that we are at a risk of an environmental catastrophe should an oil spillage happen. And um, uh, many sort of like compare this to the Exxon Valdez incident in 1989, where um, an oil, oil had uh, spilled. Uh, of course, the, the circumstances of that were completely different, but it did not even, I mean, the amount that the sulfur oil tanker holds is four times the amount of um, uh, the what what the Exxon Valdez um, held at that time. So it, it's if it spills, it's going to be an environmental catastrophe of epic proportions. Um, it could, uh, you know, affect sort of just just not just the the ecosystem of 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 the 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 maritime, uh, but also it will affect other neighboring countries, it will affect him and it will affect fisheries. The, the amount of damage that this could uh, uh, bring will, will sort of last for decades um, in, in the region. So, um, you know, in brief, this is just the general problem. Um, uh, now the question comes is how do we remedy this? And that's probably what I wanna focus on is that there has been there has been attempt to address the problem, but they have all been lacking um, a real concrete resolution. Um, so there have been political attempts with the United Nations attempting to negotiate with the Houthis in order to gain access to maintain the ship, and all of these attempts are really not materializing as um, the Houthis are are reconsidering and changing um, uh, changing their agreements with the UN time after time. Um, uh, the last agreement had allowed to um, have some type of an inspection on the ship and fix, fix some repairs, but of course the oil um, still remains there and that constitutes a problem. So the question here becomes is, what do the Houthis want out of this? So, um, what Houthis want is, they've expressed this clearly, is that they really want the revenues from the oil um, that are that is there. They feel that, um, you know, although the FCO Safir tanker is owned by Yemen's national oil company, the Houthis uh, see that they need to have, they have a claim of, for, of, of that portion of the oil, seeing that they're the de facto authority on the ground. And um, uh, they've made, a, they've, they've, continuously kept asking that they would um, uh, need to have a share. Um, and therefore, an issue like the Safir oil tanker, which is, you know, just, just an environmental issue that could affect the lives and the, the economic livelihood of, of people and would leave uh, a lasting damage uh, if something had happened, becomes more of a bargaining chip uh, for for the the, the Houthi authorities. Um, so it's it's um, you know the tanker now is 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 is, is an extremely important um, uh, bargaining chip, and and we all know that the Houthis would not have been in their position uh, of power today if they didn't um, calculate tactical moves that would serve their overall strategy of remaining in power. And they've been gaining power through time after time, whether through their manipulation of the humanitarian crisis by maintaining control or by maintaining control over the Hudaydah supplies or you know, just, just little, even through the peace process, they have been able to advance their, their political agenda and military agenda through the peace process by stalling the process and not complying at the end of it. So um, the, the issue here is that the software tanker is, is becoming more and more of a, a 
bargaining ship, something that the Houthis are, you know, trying to control so that they can have um, uh, more influence in, in negotiation and discussions. And um, what the problem is that today there are not, we haven't really seen any sound policy options that would address this issue. Um, there are some thoughts about, um, you know, contingency planning. What happens if the oil spills? Because this is this is sort of like what we can think about. Because you cannot necessarily directly pressure the Houthis, given given the question of leverage. I mean, we can we can try to find leverage in other places, and and I can talk about this a, a, a little bit more. But the the main thing that you know. The, the the international community has been thinking about is you know how do we minimize from the impact of a spill should it happen what type of contingency is there and um, um, you know as as much as the as much as the threat is recognized the ability to mobilize to minimize from the effect of that threat is are not very clear other policy options which are often championed by a lot of members in the Yemeni community is that, you know, let's think about military action in order to minimize the Houthis influence and just protect the environment. And the, the questions that arises for me around this is that um, there are no guarantees, even with a military action. So what to say that the Houthis will not um, damage the ship? You know, what, what would say, you know, so what are, what are the other things that, you, I mean, it can go just in a number of different ways. So, um, um, the, and of course, the, the, the policy action of just having discussions and negotiation, I don't think it has been um, transparent enough in a way that we, we still don't understand what type of um, discussions that the United Nations have directly with the Houthis in order to influence them on that direction. But all we know is that these discussions are failing time and time uh, again. Um, so the the one card that I feel that the international community has in its hands, and the, the one big leverage point uh, on the Houthis is, um, is international pressure to uh, to address this crisis, and in a in a same way, and and the reason for this is may not be obvious for a lot, but the Houthis do care about their um, their image, their public image. Um, they want to appear as uh, an authority that can do the right thing, uh, but that will not happen without pressure, and this pressure is is definitely needed, um, uh, and and it. It could be coordinated by, you know, a public campaign, a media campaign that would that would uh, pressure the Houthi rebels to allow access and and also for the for the oil to just be um, sold um, uh, and for for the for the maybe for that for the outcomes of of that to just go into planning for humanitarian um, needs in Yemen, as opposed to be given to the rebels or to the Yemeni government, et cetera. So it's, it's extremely important to start discussions on how to remedy this um, uh, in tandem with a public pressure campaign that can pressure the Houthis um, uh, in, in this direction to do the right thing because short of that i think we're just going to be you know really at the mercy of of the houthis hands and just um their their i mean basically we'll be capitulating to the to the houthis and just agreeing to all of their demands and and um just policy action right now around this issue is of extreme extreme significance. So um, this is what I wanted to say for now. And thank you so much. Thank you so much, Fatima, for being with us. Um, we know you're tight on time. So uh, thank you for um, for the information that you gave us today. And hopefully you'll be able to um, still tune in um, later for question and answer. OK, great. Thank you so much. And um, with that, we will turn the time over to uh, Ed Caesar. Um, 
Just before I do that, I would like to remind everyone to send us their questions in the chat and in the comment section on Facebook, and we will answer them during our Q&A session um, later on. Uh, we will also have a presentation by Dr. Abdurrahman al um, uh, the research director at WCYS, who will present the study um, that we, uh, the latest study that we published. And with that, um, I will be introducing Ed. Um, Ed is a contributing staff writer to The New Yorker. He has written stories about the mysterious owners of London's largest private residence, Russian money laundering scams, rogue publicists, and Brexit. Um, he also recently wrote, uh, uh, wrote an article for The New, York Time, uh, for the New Yorker uh, about Safed as well. Um, his career at the Independent, and um, he started his career at the Independent, and has written for the Sunday Times of London, GQ, Esquire, and the New York Times Magazine, among others. Um, in 2014, Caesar was named Journalist of the Year by the Foreign Press Association of London uh, for his coverage of the Civil War in Central African Republic. His first book, Two Hours: The Quest to Run the Impossible Marathon, about the world's finest distance runners, was published in 2015 and won a Cross Sports Book Award. In 2016, an article for his, uh, of his in the New Yorker that exposed the multi-billion uh, dollar mirror trade scheme at Deutsche Bank won a Foreign Press Award. His most recent book is The Moth and the Mountain. Ed, thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much. Um, uh, I'm honored to be here. I just, I would say I am not uh, an expert on Yemen, but I did spend a long time this year thinking about Safa and a long time in the region and talked to as many people as I could uh, for this investigation. And uh, the things that I, you know, the article that I wrote, um, was not just an investigation of the possible ramifications for Yemen and the region should the ship sink or explode, which is possible given uh, the lack of safety systems on board, um, but also the reasons why we had reached this point, uh, why we reached this point where we had this essentially a floating bomb, um, you know, a little north of Hodeida, uh, and the things that I want, you know, the importance of this issue for me, um, there is a huge environmental cost, of course, if a million barrels of oil goes in the water. But to me, the greatest and most urgent problem is the humanitarian one. Uh, I, I don't need to remind anyone on this chat of the, you know, the grave humanitarian situation in Yemen. And uh, also that two thirds of Yemen's uh, food comes through the port of Hodeida at present that um, many aid agencies um, work in the region uh, heavily reliant on her data. So uh, the, you know, the impact of a big spill that might shut the port of her data and also um, shut shipping routes through Babel Mandab uh, in some scenarios would be profound. Um, you know, the UN projected some, some numbers for what would happen in the worst case scenarios. And, and, and in those scenarios, we would be talking about hundreds of thousands of people facing um, even more acute um, issues of, you know, food insecurity, starvation, uh, disease. Um, you know, many, many thousands of people would die in those worst case scenarios. And I feel like that point has not been made, um, has not been made forcefully enough in the analyses of the suffer issue and also, um, you know, the urgency with which it needs to be solved. You know, this is, it, it, it's as if um, we knew about Beirut and the WESA, you know, the warehouses, and we ch chose not to do anything about them um, before they exploded. And in fact, it's an analogous situation to that because someone did make a report about the warehouse in Beirut and said, if we do not sort out this problem, this will explode. And it came to pass. We know about the SAFA. It's, uh, it's incredibly important um, to get it fixed. Um, I just want to say a little bit about 
how we came to this point, it, it, it was very interesting to me to, to understand by talking to people who were in CPOC, the, uh, the oil company, and people who had worked in the oil industry in Yemen, um, that we had, you know, there were so many chances to create a different outcome here, including um, building an onshore storage facility for the oil that currently resides in Safa which would have been much safer and would have connected to the same pipe plan. And for various reasons, that, that project was never completed, uh, mostly, I think, because of, um, you know, because of corruption. Uh, and there were huge delays. And it was only half completed eventually when the Houthis entered Sana'a um, in 2014. So um, there was a chance to solve this problem before it even happened. The Houthis have it within their power now to allow an inspection of the vessel, which is necessary, um, but have frustrated those attempts. And I think it's worth interrogating a little bit why that might be so. So, um, you know, Fatima was talking about their wish to uh, garner the oil revenue, but, you know, it's a, it's a little, I think, a little more developed than that, in that um, when I spoke to the Houthis negotiator on this issue, El Saraji, um, you know, I was struck by two things. Firstly, it wasn't so much the oil revenue, which is actually not a huge amount of money. Um, you know, it would be uh, less than a hundred million dollars um, at this point. Um, but it was to maintain the economic value of the arrangement that was currently in place. You know, the Houthis are currently fighting for Marib. They can see a future in which they would own those oil fields and then they would. Um, they would have a, uh, a way to offload that oil at Rasisa. So what they're looking for is to replace the SAFA with a new FSO to maintain that arrangement. And that is part of their vision for what would happen in the next few years with the, you know, with potentially either a, a power shower or some kind of, you know, Houthi dominance of the region. Um, so I think that's worth understanding that it's not simply a case of, you know, you could give them the revenue from the from the sale of the oil, and then this would be a problem. But I, we should also not discount the fact that this is a very, um, you know, it's an overwrought uh, bargaining chip. Um, and, you know, the, I, I suppose the, you know, the perverseness of the Houthis using this as a bargaining chip is the people who would be most badly affected by an oil spill from Safa reside within Houthi controlled territory. Um, this would affect the Houthis more than it would affect um, anyone else. Um, and, you know, the analogy that is used in my piece is that, you know, it's as if they are holding a gun to their own heads. Um, the other thing to say about that position is that as soon as the oil starts to leak, as it may do at any moment, or it may do in six months or in a year, whenever, is that as soon as that starts to happen, their bargaining power leaks as well. They, there is a, this only works until it does not work. <laughs> um, so I think that actually strengthens the, you know, the position of the international community who wants to see a resolution of this crisis. Um, I would also just, I just, it's not my, it's not my role as a journalist to propose solutions. You know, my role as a journalist is to simply lay out what has happened and how we got to the place where we got to and to make observations about the situation based on deep reporting, which is what I hope I did in this article. Um, but I just make some observations. The sums of money involved by the standards of these crises are not huge. It would not take a vast amount of money um, for some coalition of the international community to provide uh, another FSO to, to somehow present the Houthis who are in control of this vessel with a win. Um, that might mean overpaying. Um, but I feel like whatever it takes at this point is worth at least considering Given that the cleanup costs are estimated for a spill from the SAFA to be at least 20 billion US dollars, that if the oil goes in the water, we are talking about a minimum of 20 billion dollars to uh, clean up 
and to reopen the port of Hodeida, to uh, clear Bab al Mandab, to clear the oil from the mangrove systems. Um, it was interesting to speak to people who had been involved um, in the cleanup after the 1991 uh, oil spill um, that Saddam Hussein deliberately enacted um, when he was afraid that the US Marines were going to invade Kuwait, 11 million barrels of oil. There's still oil on Saudi beaches. There is still oil in the water column. That was 30 years ago. Uh, this is something that is very much worth everybody's time to fix now. And whatever you had to spend on it now would be a fraction of what you have to spend uh, in the cleanup. Um, I know from my conversations with various diplomats that there are very many good people, you know, both in Yemen and outside of Yemen who are engaged in this issue, who are trying to find a route through. Um, but it seems to me like uh, it would be helpful if someone took charge of this issue. And I don't know who that person or body is, um, but it feels like it has lost some impetus. Um, and one of the and one of the things that I kept on circling back to when I was doing my reporting was, you could get so far in negotiations um, with the Houthis, and then talks would always fail at some point. And possibly the reason why they failed was because it's not in the Houthis' interest to give up this bargaining chip at the moment. So someone has to make them feel like it is in their interests to do it. And that's that would be a very um, that would be a very big service to the region if someone were able to do that. Um, I was uh, yeah. I I also just make this one point that um, it can feel, especially you know, having reported from some conflict zones, and um, you know, I've never really reported from this region before, but I know from reading the daily news reports from Yemen, everything else can feel more urgent than a crisis that appears not to be unfolding at great pace. You know, there's, there is a, um, there's a phrase uh, that I use in a piece that this crisis unfolds at the speed of rust. Uh, and in a time when there are, uh, you know, there are daily battles, you know, a senior Yemeni military commander was killed a couple of days ago in the fight for Marib, when there is such an urgent humanitarian situation, it can feel like this issue slips down the list of priorities, but um, uh, it's important to have both kind of a short-term and a long-term view of what matters for a region. And this really does matter. And I, I, you know, it's become, uh, I, I'm haunted by the stakes involved here. I can't, bear the thought of the world's worst humanitarian crisis getting worse. I can't really bear to think of the people of Yemen suffering more than they need to uh, in an entirely avoidable um, catastrophe. So I hope some, some clear heads can prevail. Um, and that perhaps is, I think, my time. <laughs> Thank you, Ed. I do have a question for you. Yes. Based on your observation, um, you know, is there any, um, indications of why the neighboring countries who will be severely affected by the spill haven't really pushed for a resolution um, on this matter. Who are we talking about? Saudi Arabia? Saudi Arabia or Ethiopia, that whole like region in the in the Red Sea. Well, there's a limit to how much uh, the Houthis are going to listen to the Saudi Arabian uh, thoughts on this matter. Um, you know, when I spoke to the the Saudi ambassador to Yemen, uh, you know, he was very clear that he felt that the Houthis were holding Hodeida hostage in this, um, you know, in this matter. You know, whether that rhetoric really helps, I don't know, <laughs> but it was combative. Um, the Saudis desperately do want a resolution of the matter, but the, the fact is that they cannot engage with the Houthis directly. Um, as far as I understand it, the Omanis tend to be the interlocutors um, on this issue because they have a kind of clear line of communication with, with the Houthis. But, you know, it's indirect. Um, 
Uh, I think, you know, American uh, diplomats, you know, Dutch diplomats, British diplomats are all trying to do their part as well. Um, I also think that there is a, there is a significant, I think it's a minority, but I think it's a significant minority in the Houthi leadership who really does see the importance of solving this. Um, I don't think they're in the majority, and therefore I think their voices have been crowded out. But I think there are, there are people in there who understand how serious this is. Thank you very much, Ed. Um, we're going to turn over the time right now to Dr. Abdurrahman al Amari, who will be presenting our new study, FSO Safir, A Floating Ticking Bomb. And then afterwards, we will be having our Q&A sessions and um, we will circle back with Fatima and Ed. Thank you very much for having me with you. And I am so glad to share with you the, our latest study about Safir. Uh, Actually, this study examines the complications of the floating tanker suffer near the western coast of Yemen. The study raised sound the alarm about the looming catastrophe. Uh, the environmental disaster caused by the any spillage from the vessel would rapidly cause an economic catastrophe combined with the humanitarian crisis. Uh, I'm glad that uh, Fatima and also Ed, they highlighted some of the background of this uh, suffer uh, issue, but we can go uh, a bit uh, deeper about the historical background of the suffer. Uh, suffer uh, was built in 1976 uh, by uh, Hitachi Zosin Corporation in Japan. And then about 11 years later, uh, the ESO Japan was turned into a storage vessel and renamed Safar and owned by the Yemeni government via the National Oil Company. In 1988, uh, the tanker was anchored about seven kilometers off the coast of Yemen and used to store and export oil from inland oil fields around Marib uh, provinces. Okay. How did we get here? Uh, since the war broke down in, in Yemen in March uh, 2015, the vessel has not been maintained. In 2016, the structure of the vessel has worsened significantly. So uh, in March 2018, the Yemeni government and the Houthis formally asked UN to help them and to address this issue. In August 2019, the UN had gotten as far as brokering, uh, brokering recovery vessels stationed in the Djibouti coast. However, the night before its departure, the Houthi authority withdrew permission. In November 2020, the Houthis gained agreed to allow UN team to board uh, the suffer from uh, for a month to inspect the condition and make minor repair. However, after the Houthis refused to sign off the mission plans, the visit, which has been scheduled for, uh, for February, had been postponed. Uh, in February, UN released a new statement raising concerns that the Houthis were planning to review their earlier approval. The UN further said it could no longer predict when the mission might be able to deploy. Uh, in February 25th, uh, the UN uh, Security Council uh, issued a resolution holding the Houthi responsible for the consequences of the suspicion of the maintenance process uh, of the tanker. Uh, four or five months later, the, also the Security Council held another meeting to, dis to discuss the developments of the negotiation with the Houthis. Uh, and the member of the Security Council uh, retreated Houthi responsible for the situation and their extreme concern at the growing risk of the Safar tanker. What are the scenarios of this catastrophe? Uh, there are two scenarios. The first one uh, is the oil spill 
And this could happen that uh, when some of the oil may, may leak into the sea due to the corrosion and the lack of maintenance of the FSO. The leaking in the, in the engine room along with the uncontrollable, uh, uncontrollable water flow might destabilize and sink the entire body of the vessel, resulting in significant oil spill. The second scenario is explosion and fire on board. This scenario could occur when gas collected in cargo tank is accidentally ignited, resulting in most or all of the oil leakage into the Red Sea. Who will be affected by this catastrophe? An oil spill from the suffer could wipe out the livelihoods of about 126,000 fishermen. 850,000 pounds of fish could perish into the Red, the Red Sea, the Babel Mandab waterway, and the Gulf Adam. Uh, a suffer oil spill could impact 115 Yemeni islands in the Red Sea. It might also clog the Babel Mandab Street, the route to the Suez Canal, through which up to 12% of the global trade flows. The catastrophe impact would reach the neighboring countries as the traveling oil film would reach the Arabian Peninsula, the African coast, and the Red Sea uh, desalination plants. The significant Red Sea damage could close maritime lanes for weeks or even months on both coastlines. These developments would threaten the region's security and stability and redirect international maritime traffic between Asia and Europe. Now, uh, as I read also in, in many of the questions in the chat, what are the ways out before the catastrophe occurs? Actually, no preventive, uh, preventive measures could be taken once the spill occurs. Therefore, the only way to prevent the disaster is to prevent any possible leaking. So uh, two main solutions that require immediate action to prevent the catastrophe, which could be at any moment. The first one is the continuing the political negotiation. And this solution has been applied for the past few years the UN and the international community may use stronger language and stricter measures with the Houthis to force them to cooperate with the UN team to get on board the vessel as soon as possible. The Houthis, the Houthis have wasted many opportunities to fix this issue, and their behavior may not change in the future unless they are treated differently. The other way is the military intervention. This way, out may have side consequences on the people and the country uh, economy. And also, moreover, it faced many political and legal challenges and need international will and determination, which unfortunately has not been achieved yet. Finally, we can say that the destabilization of this part of the world can negatively affect Western countries whose economic and political interests are associated with this region. The outcomes of defragmenting the state and replacing it with militias and de facto authorities will go beyond Yemen. The 40-year-old decaying vessel, Safir Tanker, is only one case that proves that a local Yemeni issue could threaten the whole world. And thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Abdurrahman. Uh, as we see from this presentation, it gives us a, a full idea of how um, this instability in Yemen to, to take decisions and make decisions and um, do the right thing uh, has affected the entire region um, and it's going to reach out to the entire, um, to the international community as well. With that, uh, we will be turning it over to our Q&A session. So if you have any questions, please send them in the chat. We have a question here from um, Huria Mashhoor. Uh, she's asking, um, 
do you realize that the community pressure could make a difference with the Houthis who do not respond to the suffering of the Yemenis? So what would be that leverage that would actually have them take action in this matter? Fatima? Hi, uh, okay, uh, Myra, um, just a second. Um, so yeah, I think I think this question is kind of like more or less, um, uh, it, it's, it's kind of recognizes how brutal the Houthis were in terms of managing um, state affairs because, and brutal in a sense that they have put the war effort before the people. Um, they put the war effort before the humanitarian crisis, and um, they've used everything that they could do in terms of um, to to basically just gain more power, achieve political gains. The problem here is that, and I think what we need to realize is that yes, there has been instances where they've responded to political pressure when it existed. Um, so the they've you know I'll give you a, a simple example is I met with um, a human rights advocate who told me that the suffering of uh, political prisons prisoners in jail have lessened and the torture has lessened when the voices of activists and international community members increased. We've seen the Baha'is were released when there was mounting pressure from the US government, from the UK government. So whenever there is pressure on, pressure on certain issues um, that could damage their reputation, they somewhat respond favorably. Um, of course, like even in the process of responding, it takes such a long time but ultimately, what I mean is that they stole, they will stole as much as they can. So they will say, okay, we will release the Baha'is and then they'll do it a year later. So things like that happen, but with the software oil tanker, I think the same can happen is that um, consistent coordinated pressure on the Houthis to do the right thing, to say, hey, if you, if you wanna act like a, a de facto state authority, then recognize the impact of this disaster and try to think like a state and cooperate with other states as opposed to, uh, you know, just ask as just act as a as a rogue rebellion, and um, it, it would be it would be really a test that, or you know, it would like it could show how serious they are in terms of becoming more adept at governance, becoming more interested even in governance, even if that means maintaining a facade. But if if that's something that that could um, could improve their image in the international community, may, maybe that would be something that they could they could be incentivized to do like based on that. So we've seen it happen in the past. Um, we think that, I think that a coordinated effort um, on, on, that, on that front could yield good dividends. So, um, yes. Do you think there's any truth to, um, you know, this, there's a conspiracy someone is asking here, um, about the sulfur tanker being used, um, um, you know, as as uh, as a point of danger in the in the sea road of Yemen. Is I, maybe Ed would be better to answer yeah, that I'll question. Just, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll just I'll just ask that. Sorry, I was just waiting. Um, the there were certainly people who were. Um, contractors for the UN who were worried that, uh, that that the ship had been weaponized in some way, that there were, might have been explosives on board and so on. Uh, there's a senior UN source who worried that, or who his analysis was that, certainly in 2018, that um, the Houthis were prepared to engineer quite a large spill from Safa in their, you know, as a threat in their defense of Hodeida. Um, you know, the people that I spoke to who were, you know, were at CPOC or um, knew a lot about the ship said that as far as they knew, there were, no, there were no explosives on board. However, it would be the work of a day to bring them out by a small boat, you know, just because they're not there now um, does not mean that they could not be there. 
and you know i think uh, what we get to here is the difference between the you know something being actually weaponized and the sort of figurative or metaphorical weaponization of this but um it's certainly a bargaining chip and it's being used as a bargaining chip in a conflict and that is a weapon um uh, i don't know um what is going to happen who does you know in the next uh, months and years in terms of power in in Yemen but I, I think Fatima made a really interesting point which is that if you are you know if you're concerned as the Houthis are about image if you want to be taken more seriously as a as a player in the region um, you know these kinds of uh, solutions should be within your um, ambit you know you should be able to solve these problems on which are in your territory um, and it might be worth you know going down that route in negotiations rather than saying you know as many people are saying at the moment that you know we hold you responsible for this um, that approach does not appear to have worked so far so um, it would be interesting to see whether another approach could work uh do you think that the civil society, uh, political lobbying with Congress in the US um, and with the parliament in the UK could bring about change? I don't know, because it's not as if the UK government and the US government does not already know about this issue. They do know. Um, it is very, very low down on their list of priorities. Sometimes, you know, lobbying and civil society efforts can help with that. Um, but there are, you know, I, I always think that more heat and light is good, more uh, conversations about an issue are good. Um, it's a, you know, it's, it, this is an issue that requires um, somebody to take a lead. And so if the US felt that they could, you know, get a win um, here and solve this crisis, you know, you'd say that would be a good thing for the Biden administration. Um, but somebody has to make that case to them. So, um, you yeah, perhaps there's a little bit of pressure that can be exerted. From what I hear from the State Department, you know, they are actively involved in discussions about trying to solve this and, and also to mitigate the threat from a spill. So that they are working on this, but perhaps a little more pressure would help. Thank you. Uh, Fatima, I have a question here for you. Um, and it's saying, when the Houthis kidnapped the US embassy staff, there were calls by Congress to um, redesignate them um, as an FTO. There was a golden chance to use Safir as a pressure point. Why, um, why do you think the US keeps allowing the Houthis to get away um, when there are clear pressure points that could be used on them? Um, okay, so I am not entirely sure that designating the Houthis as a terrorist organization is a, is a pressuring point on them. In fact, it might have an adverse uh, reaction. So it also has an impact on the majority of Yemenis because really what distinguishes a Houthi from a non-Houthi, it's very unclear. Um, and it could be really a, 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 a death sentence on a lot of Yemenis. My, my um, you know, and I think just as, as Ed has mentioned, um, the software issue remains a low priority. It's nothing that is happening right now. And often policymakers react to the problems that they have in the now at the moment, because that's when they can allocate the funding. So even something as um, you know, intervening to prevent a crisis, I mean, we, we even, I mean, I'll make an analogy for, for COVID, for example, although there were some warning signs that this could explode and become something big, it, policymakers, you know, disbanded the units that were supposed to do that and, and just dealt with the thing as, as we saw it. And the, the humanitarian toll, catastrophe, the death toll, it was something that they had to deal with in the now. So it's, it's unfortunate that it's happening in developing countries. I, you know, and it's, it's 10 times worse in a, in a place like Yemen. So I would, I would say that something like designated, designating them as a terrorist organization is not necessarily the, the pressure point that we 
uh, that could yield some type of a positive uh, outcome because in fact, at, at that stage, it might even become impossible to negotiate um, and, and things could escalate into a military action, for example. So this may not be the, the policy solution that we should uh, work towards. But on the question of you know, pressuring and Congress, yes, they're aware. Congress is aware, civil society is aware, foreign governments are aware. But what is needed is that pressure. Do you know, we, we constantly hear, I mean, do you know, pressure has helped in, in for example, having the Saudis and, uh, and uh, the coalition lessen from the airstrikes in Yemen. It has helped minimize errant airstrikes in Yemen. You know, we, we don't hear of death tolls that are coming from, you know, the, the Saudis and, and the, the Emiratis anymore. That type of pressure could also be influential with the Houthis. We need to apply that same, you know, metric like with the media, with Congress, with everybody that that pressure can, ultimately you know yield yield some some results with the, with the Houthi rebels you might even have to look at Iran I know Iran always says that it is has nothing to do with the Houthis um, you know besides maybe smuggling here and there but um, I think you know more discussions with Iran um, um, because you know for them Yemen is a is a is a small issue in the big, big global scale of things. So there might be something that could, you know, we could give to either Iran or the Houthis on, on, on that front. And this is what negotiations is all about. You have to, you really have to negotiate and make compromises um, in order to achieve the result that you want, including, you know, some really tough policy decisions that we don't want to have. And one that could even inadvertently empower the Houthi. It has been happening over and over. But at this stage, um, I think the cost of the environmental spillage is too huge that the Houthis actually have all the power in their hands. And I'm, I have to apologize, but I have to switch off. Uh, thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you so you. much for being here with us today. Um, I would like to thank you and thank Ed and Dr. Abdurrahman for being with us today. Um, and teaching us more about this issue and educating us on what's going on and what are the possible solutions. Um, just uh, to let everybody know, um, just a reminder, a report will be published summarizing this webinar in Arabic and in English. It will be emailed uh, to all of our participants and will be available on our website, wcys.org, uh, us.org. And a reminder, um, we will also be sending you our English and Arabic uh, study. Uh, and we did also send the link to Ed's article um, in the chat for you to check it out. And with that, I would like to thank you again, Ed, for being with us and Fatima. My pleasure, thank you. And thanks everyone for joining us today and we will see you next time.